So Jason Tatum scored like 10 points under his average, and they still led at one point by 29 points over a very good and very hot Dallas team. Um, they, the Dallas has sort of a path to win, and that means Luka and Kyrie are both money. One wasn't last night. And so if you really look at the Celtics, you have five different players who could be a one or a two. So Porzingis is a one or a two score. Tatum is a one. Brown could be a one, but he's a two. Derek White on bad teams is a two. And Drew Holiday last year for the Bucks pre-Dame was a two. Four Celtics on this roster have made multiple all-star teams. The Celtics are what the NBA is trying to avoid. They didn't like that Golden State, great team, add KD. They didn't like that. The new CBA makes it almost impossible to get three stars. And whether or not you want to classify Porzingis and Drew Holiday as stars, they could drop 24 points on any night, and you wouldn't be surprised. Porzingis last night, he was the first unicorn. He was the first big that came into this game, pre-Wemby and poor, uh, 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 Chet Holmgren. Before that name just got thrown around, that term got thrown around, Porzingis came into this league, his game has evolved, and there's nothing Dallas can do. Dallas does not have the luxury or the cushion offensively that Boston has. Luka and Kyrie, for them to win, both have to be wizards. Kyrie was bad for big chunks of the game, and they got blown out. And so the Celtics have multiple paths to win in this final. Last night, Tatum didn't score a lot. Jason Tatum, their guy didn't score a lot. Didn't matter. Poor Zingas was money. So the one team in the West that gave Dallas trouble was OKC. Really had them beat. OKC is a younger, cheaper, less talented version of Boston. They don't have multiple guys with all-star appearances. And OKC, they've got a Chet Holmgren. A big who can go outside and hit threes, like Porzingis. They have multiple wing defenders. They can throw at a Luka. So Boston is a better version of the team that gave the Mavs the most trouble in the West, OKC. So Boston has the ability. They got four or five guys. They can spread the floor. Both Horford and Porzingis, their bigs, can pull you outside and hit threes. Horford, Horford's a great three-ball shooter from the corner. And, and the Celtics have three or four guys or more they can put out on a wing and defend your guys and keep throwing bodies at Luka. So this is a problematic series. I mean, Boston is 5-0 and against the Mavs, all lopsided wins when Joe Mazzula has been the coach. This may just be a bad matchup for Dallas. Now, I, I think Dallas will probably play a very inspired first quarter at least against Boston in game two because they played poorly. But if the other part of this game that's a real story beyond Porzingis and the offensive depth that the Celtics provide, which the NBA would like to avoid this kind of roster where it's got five, six guys. I mean, Horford's made multiple all-star games in his prime. They don't want this. They don't want stacked rosters. Boston's kind of a stacked roster. It doesn't feel like the Warriors because they won pre-KD. But this team is, this is all-stars. This is one and two guys, loaded, all of them. Derek White's probably the most underrated guy in the league. He made first-team All-NBA defense, and he's a very good offensive player. He's a two for a lot of teams in this league. He's a four to a five on this team. It's not what the NBA wants. The other thing is Brad Stevens, the GM of the Celtics, won executive of the year, but he didn't just win it just for adding Porzingis and Drew Holiday. He also upgraded the coaching staff. Missoula had the better game plan against the older, more experienced coach, Jason Kidd. This coaching staff is older. How about the timeout in the third quarter? Mavs get on a run. Celtics call a timeout. They tweak, they adjust, and they go to a 14-0 run. So I, I think Dallas is not a very good game one team. Dallas has been very good in game two. I think they'll play a very inspired first half against Boston. Teams that get humiliated have that urgency and desperation. I think they'll play very, very well. But Boston is a handful. They got Porzingis and Horford. They're very OKC, but better. Bigs can shoot. They can guard you one-on-one. -on -one. They can throw multiple wing defenders at you. They got four of their five guys on that team, multiple-time All-Stars. One guy, All-NBA first team as well. It's a loaded roster. 
The, the new CBA makes this hard. You need a sharp exec. You need some luck. You need some breaks. They kind of stole Porzingis. I don't think there's any question about that. All right, so Los Angeles, we got Disneyland out here. We got the mountains and the beaches. It is a nice place to visit, and that's exactly what UConn's basketball coach Dan Hurley is doing today. He is in Los Angeles meeting with the Lakers. So most college basketball coaches, like 95%, feel like college basketball coaches. They've got the big ego. I don't even have to mention the names. Uh, they need control. They're control freaks. They scream at their players from roster to set plays. They need control. They feel like college coaches. I got a list right here of about 10 guys. There's yellers, there's screamers, there's egos. And the other thing is two guys have made it, Billy Donovan and Brad Stevens. Both are really, really sharp guys. Both non-screamers. Both like control, but they're not control freaks. My concern for Dan Hurley, he's a barker. It is his DNA. He can bark. He kind of demands things instead of asking for them. And that works at the college level, especially when you're winning. I think he could work, but I could see some pushback. That's why I believe the Lakers have to give him a massive deal, $12 million a year, five years, $60 million, work with LeBron for a couple years, but eventually draft, develop, and move off him with AD as the centerpiece. Uh, I have my doubts if the Lakers can handle this. I think Hurley can handle it. He's a tough cat. I don't know if the Lakers can. The Lakers have the patience of a nine-year-old in the back of a car coming home from vacation, and they keep asking mom and dad, are we there yet? Uh, 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 Ten minutes later, are we there yet? And I think that's what the Lakers, Jeannie Buss and Rob Polinka would be asking by year three. Are we there yet? Are we great yet? Hey, 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 Dan, I mean, are we there yet? Are we almost? And it's going to take time. This is not a very good roster. It's got an old legend in LeBron and a very, very elite defensive player, not as dependable offensively, but a top player in AD. Then a bunch of guys. Then a bunch of three and four and five guys. Just guys, rotational guys. Jared Vanderbilt, Austin Reeves can, you know, a little bit of a playmaker. Not a one, two, or three in a championship team. He'd come off the bench for the Celtics. That can't be your three. I mean, come on. Derek White's a better player, and he's like their five. Poor Zingas is a better player. If you watch the first quarter of that game last night, 7-3, handles, can shoot like a guard. Come on. So I, I, don't, I don't question it. I will say Hurley is intense. The NBA, it's 82 games minimum. You make the playoffs, it becomes 90, 95 games very quickly. Paul Pierce on this show yesterday talked about his first NBA coach, Rick Bettino, who had just come from Kentucky. When you come out of college and playing for a college-based coach, I thought the pros was no different from college. Until I heard from, like, other players, veterans that were on the team, you know, you had Kenny Anderson, Dana Barrows, uh, you know, guys who play for other NBA coaches. They'd be like, you know, this is not the NBA. This is, this is crazy. It was times where we lost a game we would land one in the morning, and we'd be at the be in the gym in an hour. We practicing on back to backs, and, and, but I don't know no different. I don't know no different until like, really until like Doc come around, you, you know. And then I was like, oh, this is this is NBA. <laughs> <laughs> so again, I think Hurley could work. I think it could be a little bumpy with his volume, but it really comes down to the Lakers. Will they finally? not be the nine-year-old in the back of the car coming home from vacation? Will they be a little patient? I don't know if they will be. L.A. is a very distracted market. The Dodgers' future, the Rams, the Chargers, USC's looks really good, really successful. I don't know if the Lakers, Steve Ballmer, new arena, I don't know if they can handle being the fourth or fifth biggest story in L.A. for a couple of years. Hi, everybody. It's me, Uncle Colin. Subscribe here to get the latest from the herd, including exclusive behind-the-scenes videos and more, wherever you may be, however you may be watching.
Thanks again for making us part of your day.